You're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome to XVGM Radio, where the bits keep coming. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And this is episode 16, Data East. Yes, the sound and history of Data East. This is a company that has been around since, well, since before the 80s. Yes, They've been before around either of us. Yes, before either of us existed. That's crazy. Yes. Because we're old. We are old. <laughs> <laughs> So we are going to be diving into so many different types of games across all different retro generations of gaming. Arcade, NES, Genesis, you name it, we're tackling it for the most part. This is going to be not only developed games by Data East, but also published games because Data East was actually a really big time publisher as yeah. well as a developer. So not every game is going to be developed by them. We'll go into that as we go throughout the episode. Before we dive into the episode, we wanted to talk uh, about a quick clarification regarding some misinformation or some information that was given during previous episodes. So, Justin, what, what was it that we goofed on? So, uh, there was a couple times where we mentioned the Fujita couple. So, Harumi and Yasuaki Fujita we claimed that they were husband and wife, or married, and any other combination of being together, and that is apparently not correct, which yeah. is funny because it goes way back farther than us saying it. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some some other times where it was mentioned on your previous podcast. Yeah, so on Pixel Tunes. This, yeah. was, this was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, whoops. <laughs> but thank you to Kung Fu Carlito for clarifying that for us and pointing us in the right direction. Yeah. Because we would have just kept going. <laughs> there was a lot of speculation apparently as to whether or not they were married and I went and tried to do a little bit more research after he pointed it out and I wasn't able to find any details specifically on them being married the only details I was able to find was pe were people saying they're not married and then it was like you know just a coincidence that's a, that right they're, right they're, you know they're that's man and woman and yep. they're both work for the same company and they both have the last, same last name yep Easy to mistake, but is what it is. Yeah. So 
Know so, that going f- going forward. Yeah. And thank you, Carlito. Yes. Much appreciated. So, on to the meat and potatoes and butter <laughs> and deliciousness of this podcast. Yes. So, Data East has been around, as we said, for a while. They are also known as Deco Data East Corporation. Makes sense. Yeah. And they were founded in 1976 by Tetsuo Fukuda. Yeah. They started out as an electronic engineering company, which focused on integrating interchangeable tapes inside arcade devices. Uh, This would actually allow video game operators to replace a game from a machine without having to replace the entire cabinet. The first arcade game that they created was Jacklot, and that released in 1977, and it was uh, just a blackjack game. Yep, they were bought by G-Mode in February of 2004, Uh, and just to clarify, G-Mode bought out a large amount of Data East IPs, like Burger Time, Joe and Mac, Magical Drop, Bad Dudes, and so on and so on. But other properties were bought by D4 Entertainment, like the Robocop games, Arc System Works, like Jake Hunter, and Payon, who is the second largest Data East IP owner, owning things like Karnov, Windjammers, Chelnov, Glory of Heracles, and Kuga. Yeah, and a majority of the NES games that were published by them were either were developed in conjunction with SAS Cicada. Uh, Data East properties and licenses that these guys worked on had them brought on as hired guns to bring to the NES. It's basically converting their arcade classics to the NES. They were established in 1985 and they continued to develop for Data East up until the Sega Dreamcast, believe it or not. Yeah. Data East was also a powerhouse publisher, releasing games from other smaller developers like Beam Software. So as you can see, a lot of history with Data East going way, way back, and they've really developed and published some really classic games that we're going to talk about today. The first of which is Joe and Mac, and the track that we were brought in with was the arcade Joe and Mac, also known as Caveman Ninja, and that came out in 1991. And that was Stage Theme 1, also Stage Theme 3. And it's by Hiroaki Yoshida, Seiichi Hamada, Takafumi Miura, and Yusuke Takahama. Yes. So what do you think of that track? Uh, It was really bouncy. It was uh, really interesting. I don't know that I've ever actually seen this game in in real life. I've taken a look at some of the the levels and some of the playthrough, obviously, in preparation for this episode. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I've I've never seen the arcade cabinet or any of the ports. Mm. But the song itself, it almost had kind of like an island, like an islander type of... uh, a little bit like Super Adventure Island, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you yeah, go. Yeah, it's got that bouncy Caribbean vibe. Yes, you know yes. what I mean. Not quite reggae, not quite Caribbean, just like kind of in between. Um, like steel drums would have fit in there. Yeah, definitely. And I, I would say I really love the the like bass strings getting pulled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, like the whoa yes. right before the loop. That that's one of my, that's a really nice touch that they just kind of sprinkled in, but. Yeah. I've played the Joe and Matt games, for the most part, I think I've played almost all of them in one incarnation or the other. The Caveman Ninja was the original title, and then when they brought it over to like Super NES and Genesis, they were like, alright, well, we can't call it Caveman Ninja. Like, what are we going to call it? Because Caveman Ninja doesn't make any sense yeah. anyways. <laughs> so... No, I mean, he's a caveman and he's a ninja, right? Yeah, I but mean, I guess... Caveman Ninja. Though. Yeah, technically, Joe and Mac doesn't make any sense either. I mean, how many cavemen did, who would you think that you know? <laughs> you, me, uh, I, Joe, you, Mac. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. I, Joseph, you, Mac, Macamillion? <laughs> Macaroni. <laughs> Macaroni. <laughs> yes. Joe and Mac, they should have called it Mac and Cheese. Oh, yeah, that would have been fun. So, <laughs> this game is a action platformer where you're basically hitting dinosaurs, like angry, evil dinosaurs, and, you know, not basically not uh, going after, like, other evil cavemen to rescue the women of the tribe that have all been captured basically uh, so it's like a damsel in distress sort yeah of, yeah you know old school kind of vibe and that's the first game so joe and mac itself on the super nes and i believe it also came out in the genesis that game was a port of this game like a pretty much a straightforward port for the most part i think it added a couple things like it added an overhead map like an overworld map or whatever kind of like super mario world yeah so that is the joe and mac series it's a lot of fun 
they're they're entertaining games. They're goofy. They're slapsticky. They're you know all the characters are really well animated and <laughs> just really goofy and funny. Now the composers we're gonna talk about. You're gonna hear these names quite a bit. So we'll just slightly dive uh, into. Uh, the first four. So Hiroaki Yoshida uh, started with Data East on a game called Psycho Nick's Oscar, which came out in the arcade in 1987. Followed it up with, I'm going to try to talk about games that we're not talking about today. Uh, oh, yes. Va- Vapor Trail, Midnight Resistance, Two Crude Dudes, which is a sequel to Bad Dudes, and of course he did Bad Dudes and Bloody Wolf. Later on, probably around like the late 90s, he ended up leaving Data East and kind of was a hired gun for a little bit. Looks like he worked for Tecmo doing a game called Trapped in 2005. Uh, then kind of moved over to both Sony and Nintendo uh, yeah. doing DK, King of Swing, Jungle Climber, uh, and then a couple other games. And then he's credited for a couple of games that got recently ported as yeah, well. Yeah. So, yeah. And then Seiichi Hamada also got his start way back in 1989 with his first game, Makai Hakenden Shada, which was a TurboGrafx-16 game that was created by Data East. And again, uh, just kind of bounced around uh, from games like Fighter's History Dynamite in 94, uh, Dark Legend in 95, Virtual Cop 2003, so he ended up moving over to Sega, uh, did Shenmue and Shenmue 2, where he was the sound effects supervisor and director and uh, then moved over to the Jake Hunter series, so he kind of went back to his roots with Data East, Mm -hmm. or at least with a Data East property, because at that point, they were already bought out by that company, by Arc System Works, or there was a company that sold Jake Hunter to Arc System Works, basically. And then moved back to Sega for games like Virtual Tennis 4, Day 20 USA, and Shenmue 1 and 2, he was credited as the sound section assistance for the re-release. Yeah. So, Takafumi Miura looks like they started out uh, doing game sounds or arranging game sounds for Rampage in 1988. Uh, moved on to do more sounds, uh, a lot of sound and sound team credits. But we have a Cobra Command in 1988 as well, Al Unser Jr. Turbo Racing in 1989, Burger Time Deluxe in 1991, and the, uh, the last thing that we see here is uh, original game music, although they were uncredited for Bobo's Big Adventure in 2012. Right. Yeah, a bunch of people were uncredited for, or yeah. credited for that, right? Yeah. And then Yusuke Takahama started in 1989 with Makai Haketen Shada doing sounds. Uh, and then we have some music composer credits for Scorpius in 1991, F1 Pole Position in 1992, Tokimeki Card Paradise, Koi no Royal Straight Flush in 1996, and most recently Super Smash Brothers for Nintendo 3DS in 2014. Word. Those who didn't work on those. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move into our first track of the podcast. This is from an NES game that was obviously developed by SAS Sakata. It's called Heavy Barrel. And it came out for the NES in 1987. The track is Stage 1, and it's by Shogo Sakai, Takafumi Miura, Masaki Iwasaki, Seiyuchi H, Yuji Suzuki, and Yusuke Takahama. <laughs>
Alright, you are back, and that was Heavy Barrel on the NES, which came out in 1987. That was developed by SAS Sakata and published by Data East. The track was Stage 1, and that was by Shogo Sakai, Takafumi Muyura, Masaki Iwasaki, Seiuchi H, Yuji Suzuki, and Yusuke Takahama. Whew. Wow, what a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> so, have you played this one? No. I okay. It's a really fun NES conversion of the arcade game, Heavy Barrel. Nice. They, I mean, based on the music, it sounds pretty fun. I definitely want to give it a shot at this point. Yeah. I think the, it's two-player. What's the playstyle? Uh, it's like a shmup. shmup. It's, oh, it's, it's a, a shmup, it's, okay. It, uh, it's a running gun. It's like a top-down running gun. Like Akari Warriors? Kind of like Akari Warriors. Warriors. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I was going to say, that at first I was getting sort of a, a, shmup, a shmup feel. Yeah. And then the more it got into it, particularly because of some of the some of the sounds that are that are used in the song, like the really crunchy drums, it really reminded me of uh, like a track from Akari Warriors. Yes. Yeah, this is like if Akari Warriors was good. Oh, ouch. I, I, I have <laughs> you to see like that? Akari Warriors. You see that stab in the in the SNK gut that I just did? <laughs> I just like stabbed and twisted. I don't know. I I think it's terrible. I think. I mean, to, to be fair, I I did I did the uh, first one on NES. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, I I used to love the heck out of the game. I've played it more recently, having played it with a game genie so that so I can actually get to the end. It is. Way longer than it needs to be. Way long. Very repetitive. Yes. Um, yes. I used to enjoy it because I, I could never get farther than like maybe two or three levels in, even okay. playing with somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And that's about as far as the fun goes. <laughs> yeah. No, this game's way so, better. Like, I'll, way better. I'll have to give it a shot. So much better. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's there's not much plot. It's basically a game where you play as two dudes, you know, Rambo and Commando. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> The, or the original arcade version actually used, uh, similar to Akari Warriors, eight-way rotary joysticks. Oh, yeah. So, that was cool. But this game got ported all over the place. It got ported to the Apple II Ooh. and the DOS PC. <laughs> uh, Commodore 64, it was contracted to be ported to that. Um, I guess the development company folded, though, before it could ah. you know, be released, unfortunately. And then, more recently, it was ported to the Data East Arcade Classics disc, which is actually quickly becoming a very rare Wii release. Really? Yeah, <laughs> it's basically got a huge chunk of Data East, like, most popular games. Yeah. I believe it's all the stuff that G-Mode owns. Oh, gotcha. So, they basically, like, dropped everything that they had on this one disc, and people are... You know, it's getting harder and harder to find. I actually have a copy of it, oh, and nice. uh, it's it's you know really solid collection. So if you're listening to this podcast today and you're like, where can I go to play all these games? Definitely check out the Data East Arcade yeah. Classics collection on the Wii. It's really fun. Not much to say about the game. Basically, involving terrorists, and you're playing as two dudes who have to infiltrate the base. So just to save yeah. the president. Uh, no, no president saving. This not is not this bad, one? dudes. Okay. No, no. These, these I, thought, are, I thought it might be a theme. These dudes are not bad. <laughs> they are just heavy. Okay. There's one heavy. gun in the game, in the NES version, that looks like lipstick. Like, it looks like a lipstick case. <laughs> and I don't know why, but I always remember that, because the gun is ridiculously big, like, as compared with all the other guns. Because, yeah. like, you know, you get the pea shooters and all that stuff. And then there's, like, this giant cannon that you have to fire. <laughs> Uh, and it's like the most like powerful weapon like you know in the game or whatever. So that's interesting. The big takeaway from yeah. from this game, but yeah, a lot of fun, good game, great soundtrack. This track really really reminds me of the Bad Dudes NES game. Okay. I, I was thinking about picking that, but like it's such a like everybody picks that song. You right. know what I mean? Like yeah, it, from that game. So I wanted to try to do something a little different. I hope the Bad Dudes are not offended. I'm sure we'll be talking about them all throughout this podcast because they are bad and they are dudes, dudes yeah yes and uh, the, the the track itself was was really cool like i said it sort of reminded me of something out of uh, akari warriors mostly mm -hmm. because of, like those crunchy drums yeah i actually really like that that sound and there's a lot of nintendo games that use those like those drum sounds yeah and it, it tends to it, it tends to sit well with me unless it's really poorly used <laughs> um, i also really liked the bass line that, that ran through it yes um and it was interesting because when the bass line stopped, I feel like the bottom fell out of the song. Okay. But then, but then like, it, it comes back, and I'm like, oh, there it is again. Yeah. We're good, we're going. Definitely the driving bass yeah. line drives pretty much the entire track. 
with those really snappy, sharp drums that kind of go throughout the uh, the entire song. Yeah, it's also got some really nice like harmonized melodies as well. So I I just think it's a great action track. It's a great way to open up the podcast as well. You know, oh, yeah. aside from the fun little Joe and Mac song <laughs> that we had. So yes, it's a little bit more serious. All right, so composer-wise, Shogo Sakai has done so much stuff. <laughs> Not only with Data East, where he started in 1988 arranging sounds for Rampage, but later on doing work for Nintendo. He was a leading music composer in Kirby and the Rainbow Curse. Part-time UFO, he did sound design, Kirby Battle Royale, he did sound, and also something called Wander Song in 2018. Uh, where he's credited for quote-unquote Mother 3 in 2006. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, he's mostly done Kirby, uh, Super Smash Brothers. He did music for Sm- Super Smash Brothers Brawl, Kirby Air Ride. You know, he's worked pretty heavily probably with uh, Jun Funahashi when mm. it comes to the Kirby soundtracks. Left Data East probably sometime in like the mid to late 90s. So Takafumi Miura worked on... Rampage, again, 1988, pretty much almost all the same games uh, working alongside SAS Sakata. Ended up leaving SAS Sakata in the mid-90s after releasing Magical Drop, as well as uh, Heracles no Echo 4, which is uh, Glory of Heracles 4. Masaki Iwasaki, again, very similar credits you're going to see this all throughout the podcast. Uh, did a lot of work with the Metal Max series, which we're going to be talking about. High Seas Havoc and Dash and Desperados. Uh, Street Slam. Uh, ended up working for Sega with Zombie Revenge. And Magical Drop 3. Uh, kind of like, again, returning back to his Data East roots. And finally ending up uh, working with Shogo Sakai on the Kirby games. With Kirby Mass Attack, where he did sound effects. And Kirby and the Rainbow Curse in 2015 sound design. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, so Se- Seiuchi H only has the credit of programming on this game, but the other two we have here, Yuji Suzuki has a short list starting with Captain Silver in 1988. They were a sound creator. Al Unzer Jr. Turbo Racing in 1989, they did sound. Lock and Chase in 1990, uh, they did sounds on that as well. And their last credit was Silent Debuggers in 1991 doing sound. And finally we have, I believe we just talked about, Yusuke Takahama, but to give some other games that I did not previously talk about. Uh, Side Pocket in 1990 they did sound on, uh, Boulder Dash in 1990 as well, Kickmaster in 1992, Ribbit King in 2003, and Sonic Colors in 2010 they were sound editor. Very cool. Uh, All right. But it looks like we're getting a call oh, pretty okay. early on in the show. Uh, let's go ahead and see who this is. As XVGM Radio, you're on the air. Who am I speaking with? Hello, I'm looking for Officer Lewis. I'm sorry, there's nobody here by that name. This is a radio station. This is Robocop. Pass me through to the Detroit Police Station. Okay, hold on. Let me transfer you to my friend Tone. Tone? Who is that? Well, I mean, that was really cool. We got to talk to Robocop. He was kind of a jerk, though, but hey. Let's listen to one of Robocop's tracks from the arcade game. This is the main theme that came out in the arcade in 1988. It's by Basil Poldoris, who did the original movie soundtrack of Robocop, and Hitomi Komatsu, who was the arranger.
have returned, and that was your prime directive to do so. <laughs> and that was RoboCop. That was the main theme from Arcade's release in 1988. And that was Basil Polidurus's track, who was the original composer on the movie. And Hitomi Komatsu, who was the arranger. I love me some RoboCop. Not just the game, <laughs> but the franchise. I'm a big, big fan. The very first RoboCop movie was my favorite movie of all time. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if our listeners know. Anybody who knows Mike Levy yes. knows that RoboCop is the way to go. <laughs> that is right. That is correct. So, yeah, I don't know what it is about it. I, I just freaking love RoboCop. Yeah. I mean, RoboCop awesome. is pretty cool. I, I will say, as a kid, when, when this came out, I, I remember I saw the movie too, and I don't know how the first movie didn't scar me. I mean, I, I know I know all the, the versions that I've seen more recently yeah. are the like the unrated versions, and it's a lot more violent. But Way even more, the original yeah. movie was pretty violent. Yeah. The sequel scarred me as a child. Yeah. Um, but the first movie, I thought it was cool. And I mean, there was a RoboCop cartoon, there were mm -hmm. RoboCop toys. Man, the 80s was a crazy time. <laughs> You're going to think this is really funny, but I never saw the first RoboCop movie in the 80s or the 90s. Really? I didn't see... I saw it in, like, when I was in high school. Oh, wow. And that's when it, like, quickly became one of my favorite movies. And then, like, I would watch it, like, all the time, yeah. like, in college and stuff. So, yeah, it wasn't until then that... Because I saw it on TV and it was obviously the censored version. Yeah. So I didn't really see the original version until, like... I don't know, the early 2000s or whatever, or the late 90s. Yeah. But, yeah, growing up as a kid, the only reason why I knew of RoboCop was from the NES game, which was developed right. by right. SAS Sakata and published by Data East. This game is similar in concept. This is kind of what it's based on, so that's like, again, the NES version is the home conversion of this game if you want right, to think about it. simplified? Yeah, pretty much. Like, much more simplified. This one's a lot more, like, arcade-centric, I guess you could say, the gameplay. You know, definitely a quarter muncher, if oh, you will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas the NES game is just kind of a grind hmm. to get through. That game, the arcade game, is honestly a little bit more, like, player-friendly, I, I would say. I really want to own this arcade machine. Like, it would be <laughs> an awesome arcade machine to own, and it's one of those, like, holy grail type things. Like, yeah. oh, if I was a millionaire, you yeah, know, this yeah. is one thing I would really buy. So, but I never really played this one. I played the NES one. I played this one once or twice, and I got it on MAME. And it's, you know, like I said, it's pretty cut and dry. It's, you're playing as RoboCop, you're blasting away bad guys. That's pretty much it. As far as, like, plot and concept goes, it's a side-scrolling action game. Uh, I assume it follows loosely the plot of the movie. Yeah, pretty loose, but, you know. That's how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually kind of surprised by the song, mm. uh, or the track rather. It feels far bouncier than a RoboCop track should be. Okay. Like... Uh, yeah, I guess I could agree with that. I can see where it's coming from because th this actually is one of the movie so uh, the, one of the movie tracks yes. that's arranged, right? Yeah, yeah, this is basically RoboCop's theme. Yeah, or his theme song, like where he's going to, you know, take out all the bad guys or yeah. whatever. It's like a slight sort of montage, if you will, of him like, right, beating right. up bad guys. Although now, now that I think of it, I should probably rescind what I just said because this is something from the '80s, and yeah. I mean, with you think about how movies are made nowadays, if it's a dark and gritty movie, it's it's got like dark and gritty music yeah uh, and, and it's, it's really grungy yeah in the 80s like we they're, they're, the, the music was all over the place but it was, I mean Prince was in Batman yes yes <laughs> so you know I, I take it back it feels wrong because uh, I have a, a today mindset sure sure but for, for what it was it's actually probably spot on yeah the one thing that I that it's very superhero-y Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. That's yeah. that's sort of it. And like, I don't see I don't see RoboCop as a superhero because he just yeah. murders everybody. Well, RoboCop is based off of Iron Man as well as uh, oh. Rom, uh, and also a little bit of Judge Dredd as well. So oh. Judge Dredd, I can definitely see. Yeah, the, the 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 level of violence carries over. The Iron Man, I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah, and then Rom, who is a uh, another like Marvel character, mm. like a robot. Or whatever. Yeah, and I like how. This track starts off and sounds like you're putting in quarters. That dun it, dun it, dun it, dun it, dun it, 
and then the track kind of starts off. This track is a lot more like, there's a lot more to it than the NES version. Literally the NES version is just da 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 da. It's yeah. just that, blah, 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 you know, uh, over and over and over again. But this song here is a lot more, it's flourished out, it's blossomed a lot more. It's You've got that do 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 kind of like twinkly beginning. Yeah. And then even like more towards the end where it, it kind of like adds to the end of the track with the da 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 You didn't really get that in the NES version. That wasn't present. It was literally just da 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 you know, yeah, so. Yeah. Limited capabilities. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this version of the track, uh, arranged by Hitomi Komatsu, is it's it's just different, but it's it captures the heart and soul of the Robocop game. So yeah, uh, I agree. Hitomi Komatsu worked on Psycho Nick's Oscar in 1987, then moved on to Bloody Wolf in 88 for the Turbo Graphics and I believe Arcade, Vapor Trail in 89, Midnight Resistance in 89, Hippodrome in 89, and then a game that we'll be talking about a little later, Act Fancer. So oh, yes. Yeah, and uh, Basil Polidurus is actually labeled for a couple games. Uh, Robocop 2D, <laughs> which is an original freely released me remake of the Robocop arcade game. So basically they're credited for the original this game soundtrack. that got re-released, oh, right? Wow. And that was in 2004. I don't know if that got an official re-release. I think it did. It was really re-released on PC by Titus. Hmm. Gotcha. Uh, also, the Conan game in 2004 was credited for Anvil of Krom and Battle of the Mountain, I believe. Hmm. And uh, Robocop 2D2, Robocop vs. Terminator in 2005, oh. <laughs> uh, which is a sequel to Robocop 2D. So Very cool. Yeah, yeah. And that has music from the Terminator and Robocop games. Or Robocop movies. Movies, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much it. Uh, he died in 2006, I believe. So, unfortunately... But it's about uh, it's about it. Pour That's one it. out for Basil. Yeah, yeah. Pour pour one out for Robo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, coming up next, we're gonna hear a track from a game called Atomic Runner Chelnov. This is an arcade game that came out in 1988. The track is called Ending, and it was composed by Azusa Hara, Hiroaki Yoshida, Tatsuya Kuichi, and Tenno. Tenno.
And welcome back. That was Ending from Atomic Runner Chelnov, which was an arcade game that came out in 1998, published by Data East, developed by Data East, and composed by Azuzahara, Hiroaki Yoshida, Tatsuya Kiyuchi, and Tenno. Tenno, yes. Tenno. So you haven't played this one, right? No, no, I, uh, I, I actually didn't even realize that it was ported a, a couple times yeah. until, uh, until just recently. Yeah. Um, it also ha goes by a couple different names. Uh, it's known as Atomic Runner Chelnov, Chelnov Atomic Runner, <laughs> Atomic Runner Chelnov Nuclear Man, The Fighter, and, uh, Atomic Runner Chelnov Fighting Human Power Plant. Yeah. Yeah, it's got <laughs> a bunch of different names. Yeah, it's uh, pretty, pretty interesting, but from, you know, taking a look at it, it is a side-scrolling, uh, constantly side-scrolling, run-and-gun type of game. You uh, control Chelnov's movements with a, a, you know, an eight-way joystick on the arcade cabinet, and then you've got buttons for attack, jump, and turn around. And you can get six different types of weapons that you can collect and power up to improve his like attack power, height jump, Turnaround stopping speed. <laughs> yeah, he can jump like really crazy high. If yeah. I recall. Yeah, no, there, and he, he, can, he can jump pretty high, and then you can make him jump even higher. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, there, there's all sorts of different power ups in this. The the plot of the game centers around specifically. This is about the arcade game because the plot was actually changed in the Genesis and other ports. Mm. But so the original plot of the game was uh, Chelnov, who, if you are familiar with Karnov, Chelnov is a a relative of Karnov. Uh, he's a coal miner who miraculously survives a malfunctioning power plant that explodes. Um, his body gains superhuman abilities due to the radiation, you know, classic power right, up from right, uh, right. the comics yep. by that explosion. And then a secret organization tries to, you know, kidnap him and harness his abilities for their own evil plots. Right. Um, and then he has to battle and defeat the secret organization using his newfound superpower. Yeah, it's it's inter it's interesting because it's very controversial uh, yeah. back in the day. This game came out right around the time of the Chernobyl incident, the disaster where they had a meltdown of uh, a Russian nuclear power plant. And so it's just kind of, I don't know, they tried to pass it off as like ironic, where initially they said that, uh, you know, you got a coal miner caught in a nuclear accident. There's also a hammer and sickle that's visible on the opening title screen, title screen yeah. of the arcade version. So what the, what ended up happening was people got offended, and then Data East had to go on some TV show, and they were like, no, 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 he's actually a relative of Karnov. Like, it's okay, it's cool. <laughs> One of our other characters, like, it's, it's all good guys. And then apparently, I guess, the development staff later on said, oh, no, actually, it was loosely based on Chernobyl, which is where the name Chelnov came from, but, you know, the the elements of parody are merely coincidence. Yeah. So they weren't intentionally going after the Chelnov in incident. Of, the Chernobyl incident. Yeah, yeah. To, to parody it. They were... It just kind of... Just kind of accidentally happened, right? Yeah. So uh, basically what they ended up doing for the Genesis port of the game is they just completely removed anything to do with Chernobyl. Oh, yeah, they, they just made him, like, a regular guy who right. uh, wears, like, a super suit, basically. Something like that, yeah. And, yeah, it's, like, a special combat suit, and then he's battling enemies to rescue his younger sister. Right, which yeah. I believe that's why he's not called Chelnov. The Genesis version yeah. is just called Atomic Runner. Atomic Runner, right, right, right. Right. Interestingly enough, there's also some crossover with other Data East properties. Uh, Chelnov also appears as an enemy character in Trio of the Punch Tumble Pop in, from 1991 and Fighter's History, Mizo Gucci Kiki Ipatsu in 1995. Uh, he can also be seen being transported in a frozen container on a freight train in Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninja 1988, and in Sly Spy 1989, there's a poster showing Chelma that can be seen in the beginning of Stage 4. Right. I really love this track. This is yeah. such a good song. I mean, I really love the Genesis version of the Stage 1 theme, but I never heard the arcade version and just kind of assumed, like, I don't know what it is, but I always assume that the arcade versions are worse when it gets ported to Genesis. <laughs> Maybe it's just like because of Midnight Resistance because uh, yeah. that version was arranged by Hitoshi Sakamoto and it's just like so much better on the <laughs> Genesis. Like infinitely better. So it's like now whenever I hear oh yeah it got ported to the Genesis I'm, I'm always like yeah the arcade version is probably worse <laughs> when it comes to the music. But this is actually really really good. 
Yeah, no, I, I like this one a lot. I mean, the track itself is kind of a motif. It, I mean, you're, you're hearing a lot of the other level music right. throughout this because it's an ending song. You're, yeah. it, uh, it's li- this is likely the credits. Yeah. Um, it's either the credits or like a, a, a closing cinematic. But one of the things that I'm noticing here across the few tracks that we've listened to so far is Data East's music or composers have a... A, a, just a thing with really powerful bass lines. Like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to compare it to that Sunsoft bass. Oh, sure. The, Two totally different things. Yeah, yeah. But the, the bass lines. One involves that. Yeah, exactly. Right. And the other doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is just that Data East bass. Yeah. <laughs> That data easy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the, the baseline in, in a lot of these, I'm just finding myself really like kind of getting this groove from them that I, that I really enjoy. I mean, in one of your previous tracks, I mentioned when the bass stopped, yeah. I felt like the bottom dropped out of the song. Right, and then it right. Came back. And then this one is just like a. Yeah, I, I really think that this invokes like Miami Sound Machine. Oh, yeah. Like it, it has that real like Latin, like Latin vibe. Almost like borderline freestyle, but it's I would say more in line with uh, with like Miami Sound Machine type stuff. So it's just got really great driving bass line, of course, but then you've got those really energetic main synths that mm, just yeah. are kind of all over the place. They're not like insanely wacky or anything, but they're they're just really strong, really melodic and really strong. So right, I, right. I was really enjoying this track. So good pick, Justin. Thank you. Thank yes. you. So the composer on this one, Azusa Hara, started out in 1986 with a doing music composition on a game called Shackled, and moved up through the ranks doing all sorts of music composition. Uh, we mentioned Psycho Nick's Oscar, uh, 1987, from some of the other Data East folks. Uh, they worked on that. Bloody Wolf, Bad Dudes, Vapor Trail, 1989. Uh, Midnight Resistance we mentioned, 1989, and 1990 was their last one doing sound effects in a game called Dark Seal. We have spoken already a little bit about Hiroaki Yoshida, so Tatsuya Kiyuchi has done, starting out in 1987 with that Psycho Nix Oscar game, the, doing music composition on that, the music composition on Dark Seal in 1990 as well, and also some of the Joe and Mac games, Joe and Mac Returns 1994, Joe and Mac 2 Lost in the Tropics 1994 as well, and closing out with Magical Drop F in 1999, they did sound design. Uh, and then finally, Tenno, we have no info on. This is... He's Tano. Yeah, I mean, potentially this is the only game. Yeah. So that is going to take us into uh, my next pick here. Do it, Justin, do it! Yeah! So next up we have a game called Act Fancer Cybernetic Hyperweapon. And this is a game that was released in the arcades in 1989. The track we're going to hear is called Cyber Brain, also called BGM3, and was composed by Azusa Hara, Hiroaki Yoshida, Shuji Sagawa... Tatsuya Kiyuchi, Hitomi Kimotsu, and Kenji Mori.
Welcome back. That was a game called Act Fancier, Cybernetic Hyperweapon. Sounds fancy. Sounds fancy. Act Fancier. Act Fancier. <laughs> that came out in the arcade in 1989. The track was called Cyberbrain, also called BGM 3 or Background Music 3. And it was composed by <gasps> Azuzahara, Hiroaki Yoshida, Shuji Sagawa, Tatsuya Kiyuchi, Hitomi Kimotsu, and Kenji Mori. Let's just do the composers just to get it out of the way. Get out of the way. Because there's a lot, and it's a lot to cover, but we've already talked about a lot of them. So. True, true. So I just talked about Azuzahara in the last break. Right. Hiroaki Yoshida, we talked about. Uh, Shuji Sagawa did a composition for this and Bloody Wolf, and that's okay. it. All right. Tatsuya Kiyuchi, I just talked about. Uh, Hitomi Kimotsu, I think we touched on earlier, but just to yeah, double check. The, uh, yeah, yeah, Robocop. Yeah. Yep, Robocop. Yep. Uh, and then, so the only other one we have is Kenji Mori, and he did this and Dark Seal. Sweet. Nice. Cool. Knock out was, the park. For, for, for a lot of people, that went far quicker. Yes, much quicker. <laughs> so, so, this game I've not played. I've never even heard of it, to be honest with you. So this game is actually a run and gun. It is a very interesting looking game. So you are the uh, a cyborg guy battling against aliens. Uh, and the aliens are actually kind of gross. They remind me sort of like the aliens from like the xenomorphs. Uh, okay. Like they, they don't necessarily look like the xenomorphs, but they are very like, what's the word? Bah, Heady? Bah, no. Thick headed? <laughs> no. Egg shaped heads? What, what? <laughs> Salami heads. <laughs> Salami. No, they are not xenomorphs. <laughs> biological aliens. I mean, all aliens are biological. What's the <laughs> word that I'm looking for? Meaty. <sighs> meaty aliens. You're a meaty alien. I am. Nice. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> so sweet of you to say. No, but they're they're really weird looking. Is all is all I can say. I I can't think of the word, and I will probably think of it like an hour after I leave this recording. Probably. But they're often like. Small, really low to the ground. They look kind of gross and, and slimy and and weird. Sounds delicious. But it, it reminded me sort of like a combination of a run and gun and like a gradius. Like the bosses okay. often were, you know, stuck to the right side of the screen, um, and you were just you know throwing stuff at them sure. to, to kill them. Deli meats. Yes, yeah. usually um, like deli meats uh, all over them. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, there, so there's a couple of power ups uh, that you can grab as you run through the game. There's a blue orb. Uh, and a red orb, blue orb, powers up your Fencer One evolution. So you collect five, five of them, and you 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 evolve into uh, into a new guy that runs and guns. <laughs> and then there's a red orb that increases time on your Evo timer. Okay. Which, uh, if the Evo timer runs out before you collect a, a blue orb, you de you devolve one level. So you you collect the blue orbs and you, you power up uh, and then the red orbs kind of give you more time to be in that powered up form. But then there are six forms and they are all named in the manual apparently. So your initial form is called Nuts. What? Really? Your, your initial form, Nuts, fires forward. You revert to this form upon being hit by an enemy uh, and any of your other forms. Your, uh, your, so that's your initial form. Your uh -huh. first form, your first evolution is called Sis. That fires two shots aimed at the ground which will ricochet and destroy um, enemies. Your second form is called chiffon. Uh, you are a thin see-through fabric. <laughs> really? Um, like chiffon the fabric? It's C-H-I-F-F-O-N. Okay, okay. Um, but no, so your third form fires three projectiles at the ground which explode on impact and jet flames fly, fly out of it. Your third form is called Ix. I-C-K-X. <laughs> I'm just trying to pronounce these things here. Um, you fire five projectiles in a fan-like pattern uh, from above the fencer, okay. uh, which is you. Your fourth form is called Benabu. Benabu? Uh, <laughs> you're going to laugh at every one of these. Uh, actually, no, that's probably the last one you're going to laugh at. The fifth form is called Ares, and your sixth and final form is called Zakros. Um, and Zakros files missiles into the air that are homing. Okay. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It is. It's a pretty ridiculous game. Okay. I, I remember seeing this a while ago and thinking, "Wow, that was it." I really love from like thirty-seven-ish seconds until the loop of this track. Okay, it is just balls to the wall, <laughs> awesome solos and craziness, and there's just so much going on. It's just like right up my alley. And then it goes into the loop, and I don't know what it is about that those initial notes. It reminds me of like '50s rock, 
Oh, yeah. You know, like that. Like that. That. I don't know. And it's just like I don't know. Maybe it's just the arcade tone that they use, but like it just sounds really flat to me. So like the initial like first ten to twenty seconds of the track, I'm I'm not intrigued at all, and then it just totally grips me and takes me hold in the in the thirty second range. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the music from this game is sort of like that. Yeah. Um, it it I wouldn't say that it's all over the place, but it it often starts out kind of weird or or a little bit flat, and yeah. then picks up part huh. way through part part way through the track. Cool, Nito. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move out of the arcade and into the NES. We're going back, and we're going to be listening to a track from a game called Werewolf the Last Warrior on the NES. This came out in 1990. Now we're gonna be cheating a little bit on picking two tracks. This is Stage Theme, Human and Werewolf. How Dare. How Dare. By Shogo Sakai, Takafumi Muyura, and Yusuke Takahama. Presented by Data East. XVGM Radio. Ow! Welcome back! That was Werewolf the Last Warrior on the NES, and that came out in 1990. That was both stage theme Human and Werewolf by Shogo Sakai, Takafumi Miura, and Yusuke Takahama. What are your thoughts on this one? Wow. <laughs> um, so I, I really liked in the first bit the the, the drum fills. I mean, you were <laughs> you were going nuts for them, but I thought, I thought those were really really cool. I was I was also really surprised at how short that was. Yeah, um, I, I was when I was first looking and saw that it was two tracks. I was like, really? Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. And then, and then the first track was all of like twenty seconds. Right. So yeah, pretty much. No, uh, that was nothing. It's super repetitive. That's why. I, okay, so here's the thing. <laughs> to me, those two tracks are the equivalent to play it's like if you're gonna play whole lot of love by led zeppelin you gotta follow it up with living loving maid she's just a woman like you can't you (laughs) you cannot play werewolf and play just one either the human 
mm-hmm. portion or the werewolf portion, you know, <laughs> the stage theme, without playing both. You yeah. Really, it's how you get the full version of the song. So, Werewolf The Last Warrior is an NES game. It has pretty much always been an NES game. It's not like a, an arcade conversion. So this was actually mm-hmm. technically an original title. Nice. This was developed... I believe in tangent with SAS Sakata, so Data East and SAS Sakata worked together on this one, um, but it was published by Takara in Japan, interestingly uh, enough, yeah. So you're essentially playing as this werewolf character, but he has sharp blades for arms, like his hands are blades, Oh. and you start off as a regular dude, like just a regular... Not you know, a bad dude. Not a bad dude. Just no. Regular dude. Um, the game takes place on a place called Red Earth, which is the second colony planet towards Earth. And so Mars. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not Mars because right. they call it Red Earth specifically. Right. Right. So I guess this doctor named Doctor Farian went into this cave in uh, Red Earth, and apparently. He was turned into some sort of, like, an evil bad guy by some sort of entity that was inside the cave. And then he somehow creates his own army of evil mutants. Sink. Who, yeah, who then take over Earth. So... Earth or Red Earth? Regular Earth. Uh, right. Not Kool-Aid, Red Earth. Right, right. Like, regular Earth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The blue-flavored Kool-Aid Earth, right. Oh, no. Not the red Kool-Aid. So... You play as a character named Ken, and Ken can transform into a werewolf whose name is Warwolf. <laughs> I don't know why, like, but uh, like spell it. W-A-R, like war. Warwolf. Warwolf. Right, right. <laughs> okay, that, that that makes a little bit more sense. Though. A little bit. <laughs> the way you were saying it, Warwolf. <laughs> warwolf. <laughs> so the terpiest wolf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You start off the game initially, and you're fighting this random dude who is like, like long-haired and scraggly, and um, you're fighting him. And if you get, if you hurt him enough, he will disappear. But before he does, he basically gives you this superpower. And he, fed, he says something really funny. He says like, "No more heroes, fuzzball," or something <laughs> like that. I can't remember what he says, but he ends up giving you the power to turn into this Warwolf character. So Ken turns into him, and Ken, by the way, is like, he looks like, I don't know, if Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden had a Sprite, <laughs> he would look right. like like 90s Bruce Dickinson, like long hair, like long brown hair, mm-hmm. caveman kind of like walking, like, you know, kind of like a Simon Belmont kind of stature, oh, okay. a little bit, and I don't know, just for whatever reason, he looked like Bruce Dickinson a little bit, I don't know why, but anyways, so you can get these... W's that can either turn you into a werewolf or turn you back into a human, which that's what the blue ones do, and the red ones turn you into a werewolf. You can grab these th- these like bubbles, and the bubbles will make you turn angrier. And if you get five of them, you can turn into a super werewolf, where you can do like double damage and like oh. yeah, you're more powerful. There's also this gun power up that you can get. So I was going to ask because you mentioned that 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 it, that it might be based off Marvel property, right? Warwolf from Marvel yeah. is like a werewolf with a ton of guns, right? Right. So, so what's really funny is a mutual friend of ours, our friend Brian, uh, used to play this game all the time when we were in college, and I never played it when I was a kid. So this was my first experience is basically watching him play this game, and he, you know. I've talked about this before on Pixel Tunes, but Brian and I used to come up with goofy songs <laughs> and like lyrics to the songs. So at the part in the song, the werewolf version of the song, where it's like da 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 da, he would always go, "I got the gun" or, or something <laughs> like that. So yeah. I don't know why I can't explain it. It's just Brian being goofy, but yeah, yeah. It, yeah, pretty much. So I don't know. It's a really fun game. It's also a really difficult game. There's really difficult platform mechanics where like you have to grab onto a pole above you but you have to do it just right like it's really hard to do mm. you know it's pretty much like an action side scrolling you know platformers kind of game so um, fun game great soundtrack I, I love the use of toms in both of these songs yeah, yeah. you know uh, just both of them have killer toms like some of the best on the NES in my opinion 
I can see that. I, I will say the the second part of the song, yeah. uh, the second song, um, I really, really dug the melody. The So the last couple tracks, I, it was funny because a few breaks ago I was saying that, oh, I'm, I'm noticing a pattern of like yeah. really strong bass lines mm-hmm. and stuff. And then like almost as soon as I said that, the next few songs we listened to didn't have really strong bass yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they were there, but like this one, I don't like I don't feel like it needed a bass line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it, it, there was one there, but like the melody really carried this The melody one. and the drums were yes. like top notch in this. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we already talked about Shogo Sakai, Takafumi Miura, and Yusuke Takahama, so don't need to repeat ourselves there. We're going to jump into the next track, which is your pick. What do you got for us? Yeah, so next up we're going to hear a track from Captain America and the Avengers. The track is called Stage 5. The game came out in the arcades in 1991 and was composed by Tomoyashi Sato and Tatsuya Kiyuchi. back to XVGM Radio. That was Captain America and the Avengers. Came out in the arcade in 1991. The track was called Stage 5 and was composed by Tomoyashi Sato and Tatsuya Kiyuchi. Whoa, whoa. I think you mean Captain America and the Avengers. Avengers. Yes. There you go. I love the use of PCM samples in this game. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is one that I have played. This was all over the arcades. Yeah. I remember this growing up uh, as well as, I mean, a number of Marvel games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this this one was uh, well, like a beat-em-up action yeah. adventure platformer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like the you know the X-Men games. Your health stuff. was quarters, essentially. <laughs> or like your health would be like numbers and then like when you ran out of like health which happened very fast. What? An arcade game? No. Never. 
<laughs> but you had to pump more quarters in. I only really played the Genesis port of this, which I own. Hmm. So what did you think of the track? Uh, so the you track, picked it. Yeah, I mean, what, what did you think of the track? Okay, <laughs> good question. I like those, those synth hits. Hmm. I just feel like they're too on point with being too... I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain. It's like they're on point with the beat, but they're not... I don't know. Like I prefer my synth hits to be either like once a measure or like obscenely annoying, you know? Where it's just like... You know, like something like that. Or make it where it's like... Do 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 you know blah blah yeah, blah, blah yeah. and then like do 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 and kind of brought it back that would be fine but this it's just like so you feel that they use them it's very repetitive yeah so you feel they use them an obscenely moderate amount yes <laughs> exactly it's not my favorite song on the podcast but not a bad song it has like a very kind of sort of militant sound mm-hmm. a little bit. But I think the thing that kills it for me is the repetitive nature of, of the, the hits. of the synth hits. Yeah, it's it's that they're either not repetitive enough <laughs> or not laggy enough. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but no, that's fair. I mean, I I picked this one because I found it interesting. Like it, it reminded me of something else. Like it reminds me sort of of. Uh, the some of the music from Marvel vs. Capcom specifically because of the synth hits, right? right. Um, and I just sort of took to them. They're so they're not super common in a lot of the other tracks on this game. Yeah. Uh, but as I was listening through them, uh, like I, I heard this one, I just kind of kept coming back to it because I, I I found it mostly amusing <laughs> because I I it felt like a track from a different game from a different company. Right. But yeah, no, overall, I, I enjoyed the melody of, of the track and what the song was trying to do far more than the actual synth hits. Um, you're right, I mean, listening to it af- after a few listens, the uh, the hits do... They keep coming. Keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, 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 Zing. I, I, I think, personally, that they were used too much. I don't know that I could stand something that, that uses them as much as you want them to be overused. Yeah. Um, like, I, I get the novelty of it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. Be just too much. I like it when they're obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, I like like stuff like uh, Violent Storm, mm. uh, which is a great soundtrack that utilizes them like way too much. <laughs> uh, so stuff like that is is really fun to listen to to yeah. me. But that or like if you keep it New Jack Swing style, like oh. Belle Biv DeVoe, like that yeah, type yeah. of stuff, where it's like you know you'll have a synth hit, you know, once a measure, that sort of thing. So. Yeah. So the game itself, yeah. for folks that aren't familiar with it, it is a you know four-player arcade game. You can choose between Captain America, Iron Man, Hawkeye, and Vision. Uh, each character can fight hand-to-hand or throw select items around the ground or use a special ranged attack with either a project like Captain America throws a shield. Right, like Hawkeye arrows, shoots the arrows, Iron like Man that. shoots the blaster, Blast. and Vision mm-hmm. just stares at stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's got a, a <laughs> face beam or something. Yeah. Um, ch- 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 Oh, the Avenger attack. Uh, other Avengers, including like the Wasp, Quicksilver, Wonder Man, and Namor the Submariner, appear when special power ups are collected. Sort of right. like the um, like like the call-ins from Marvel's yep. Capcom. Yep. This is a beat 'em up, not a fighter. But the story of the game uh, is that like, the Red Skulls assembled an army of supervillains, like he does, right, and other henchmen and whatnot to take over the world because that's all he ever tries to do. <laughs> uh, aside from just like the generic Bob and Tom enemies, um, you've got <laughs> <laughs> bad guys or villains like uh, Claw, Living Laser, Whirlwind, the Sentinels, right. Wizard, Grim Reaper, all types of villains from the, those four Avengers rogues galleries. Right, right. Uh, Pepper the uh, the game. Yeah. And it's just, you know, going through the game, beating people up until you eventually get to the Red Skull and beat him up too. That's right. Take that Red Skull. Yeah. Cool. The composers on this, we talked a bit already about Tatsuya. But uh, Tamayoshi Sato, who is also sometimes credited as Tom Sato, started off doing sound in 1990 on Super Burger Time, did some sound on Robocop 2 in 1991, Diet Go-Go in 1992. Diet Go-Go? Diet Go-Go. Okay. I'm curious about that one now. Sounds delicious. Uh, a game that I love, I've never really played it, called Hot Wheels Burning Rubber in 2001. <laughs> Uh, Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed in 2004, and finally they were a sound artist on Jonas in 2009. Okay. Well, it looks like we're getting a call on the patron line, according to Janine, so we're going to go ahead and give that a listen. Caller, 
You are on the air. What do you want to hear? Hey, this is Scott McElhone, and I'd like to request stage theme one from Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum. <laughs> okay, Scott. Okay. You got it. Let's hear Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum. Came out in the NES in 1990. This is Stage Platform 1, and it's by Tanya Smith. back. That was our patron pick of the night, picked by our patron Scott McElhone. It was Dash Galaxy in the Alien Asylum, which came out in the NES in 1990. The track was called Stage Platform 1 and was composed by Tania Smith. That was a very repetitive track. We had to cut it at two loops. Yeah. Just because it does get a bit repetitive. Yeah, but it was pretty fun. I like the, the, the sort of Revolving, driving, un, like underlying background rhythm. Like the bass. Like, yeah, yeah. Do, 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 do. Right, yeah. right, right, right. That was pretty good. And I, I did dig the melody. It kind of stuck me. It's going to be stuck in my head for a few days, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of an earworm. Yeah, a little bit. It's, it's one of those games soundtracks that really kind of sets the standard for what certain developers were doing with this NES sound hardware. This game was developed by Beam Software, published by Data East in North America. But this game does kind of reek of being North American, or at least being a European release that was geared towards Americans. It's a very, like, Flash Gordon kind of styled game. Uh, you play as this character, Dash Galaxy. He's a space scout. Uh, he gets captured, and basically you're going through It's kind of like an action platformer mixed with puzzle elements where you have these like block moving puzzles that you can go through there's like side scrolling action puzzles the floors have like an overhead view sort of like top down hmm. so and then there's keys that you can grab to get to different floors all across the game so it's a very like limited type of game and limited type of style so i think the music fits with this because it's sort of like limited type of music so to speak mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah i think it fits for what it is. If this was in, like, Mario, this would not be great. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but, like, yeah. it, knowing what it's made for, I think it fits. That makes sense. Yeah. So, I know the composer on this one actually has a little bit of a history. Yeah, um, Tania Smith, T-A-N-I-A. -A. She is an Australian composer. She's actually an Australian musician. Um, I shouldn't just call her a composer, because right. she is known for her work in the band Space Junkie. Yes. Um, and, I mean, she started into music when she was eight, way back, on the piano, and likely worked her way up to keyboards and, uh, and does composing. Her game composition history yeah. looks like it starts off in 1989 with Roadrunner on the NES, and... She did a number of things on the NES, actually, between 89 and 94. NES and Game Boy, it looks like. Uh, Rocket Ranger on the NES, Days of Thunder on the NES, uh, Family Feud on the NES, NBA All-Star Challenge on the Game Boy in 1991, and last game, NBA Jam on 1994 on the Game Boy. Also, there is an unreleased NES game called Exploding Fist that she did uh, some work on. Cool. Yeah, so she has little bit of quirk to her. She's kind of uh, interesting. She uh, toured with Kylie Minogue as the keyboardist. Yep. And also she currently lives in Nashville, Tennessee. She plays with a band, Space Junkie. And uh, the other members of Space Junkie are also Australian. Right. And because they all live in different places in the world, they play online in the band together in Second Life, the game. Yes. So 
they play as 3D characters in Second Life, but they're playing musical instruments, which is pretty neat. Uh, also, Tanya's character in the band is named Shakti, and she also makes jewelry as a side hobby, a side outside from her musical career. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I've never... I've only ever met two types of people that play Second Life, furries and griefers. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I've only met two people that make jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that might be true too, actually, but that's a sad point. Um, but no, that's actually really cool that uh, they, they play their music live via Second Life. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a really uh, creative way to handle the fact that they don't live anywhere near each other. Yeah, most of the games that she's worked on, as far as games go, are, uh, for the most part, like, licensed materials. You know, yeah, like, yeah. stuff like Back to the Future and whatnot, but... Hunt for the October. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know. But she also did the last Ninja port on C64. She did the port over to the NES, yep, so... Yep, yeah. Cool. Well, next up, Justin has a lovely little pick for us. What do you got? I do. Uh, I have a track called Destroy the Truck! Woo. It's got an exclamation point on it, so I had to yell. Um, it is from the game Dash and Desperados, which came out in the Genesis in 1993. It was composed by Masaki Iwasaki, Hiroyasu Fujimaru, and Manabu Yokoi. I'm Striker, and together we're Bad Dudes! Do you want to be cool like us? Be bad? Weight lift? Hang out with bodacious babes and ride tasty waves? <laughs> I know I do. Striker, that's because you already do. Oh yeah! Duh! Do you want to chat on on burgers with Ronnie Reagan? Uh, Blade? Bro? I think he's... Then you need Bad Dudes Dude Odorant. Spray or rub a stick of our patented scent all over your genitals and or armpits and prepare for buns, guns, and funs. Get it while you can, today! Bad Dudes Dude Odorant comes with all you see here. Now available at all Right Maid, Turgid, and nobody weeps the bids. Do not try to eat the stick or spray. Sexy buff people only. Sold everywhere except Utah. Note, President Ronald Reagan is dead. All consumption of burgers with him are strictly prohibited. Adults, get your kids' permission. Welcome back. That was Dashin Desperados, which came out in the Genesis in 1993. And the track was called Destroy the Truck, composed by Masaki Iwasaki, Hiroyasu Fujimaru, and Manabu Yokoi. I've never played this game, but I've heard of it. Same. And looking at it, the... <laughs> the box art is somewhat terrifying. Yeah. It's, it's got some interesting claymation-looking <laughs> cowboys on it. Yeah. That look like they want to do bad things to somebody. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a platforming game developed and published by Data East. As I said earlier, it came out in 1993. It's got a one-player mode and a two-player mode, but the idea is that you are a uh, cowboy... In the one-player mode, you play as Will, uh, racing on, against your nemesis, Rick. In the two-player mode, one of you is Will, one of you is Rick, and you are chasing after a woman named Jenny, and 
you are running through the level, you know, platforming, jumping over things, trying not to get smashed by the uh, the, the, the obstacles and, and enemies. Uh, and when whoever gets to her first gets a kiss. Okay. So it's it, you have to play this two player. No, no, no. Uh, in, the, in the one player game, you, you just play as Will, um, and you are you're racing against Rick. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, either way, you're racing. So it's like Rick. AI controlled Rick. Exactly. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, in, the, in the two player game, it's it's a little bit because both characters are players. Whoever gets to her first wins. Ah. In the in the, the single player game, if uh, Rick gets to her first, he kidnaps her and takes her away. Mm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. This track has a little bit of flashback to the Chelnov Atomic Runner track. Oh points. yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially that that melody. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and there's a that part where it goes do 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 do. do, do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just like in Atomic Runner. Yeah, so. I, I was mostly focused on the uh, on, on the twangy gu- guitar type. Bow, yeah. Bow, 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 bow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, like I said, very similar to Chelnov. Yeah, yeah. I liked it. Yeah, it was good stuff. Pretty good. Pretty good. It's all right. So, all right. yeah. So that's Dash and Desperados. So, what about the composers? So we did talk about Masaki Iwasaki earlier when you mentioned them in Heavy Barrel. Yes. Uh, so Hiroyasu Fujimaru has a sort of short list of audio credits. They did uh, some sound driver programming on Chelnov. They did this Dash and Desperados in 1993. And in 1995, they did sound driver programming again on Minnesota Fats, Pool Legend. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have Manabu Yokoi. The only audio credit they actually have is Dash and Desperados. They did art and graphics in also Dash and Desperados, uh, as well as Backstreet Billiards 1998 and Slide Adventure Mad Kid in 2007. Ah, okay. So just to fluff that one up a little bit. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Yes. So, uh, all right. So that will lead us into our next track. This is my last pick, uh, "Wind Jammers," which came out on a lot of stuff. Yeah, um, they're, they're, <laughs> I feel like I'm reading the list of composers from an earlier track. <laughs> so this came out in the arcade Neo Geo Neo Geo CD in 1994 on the PS4 in 2017 on the Switch in 2018. Yes. The track is called You Got a Power Concrete Court. <laughs> and it is composed by Seiichi Hamada, Tomiyashi Sado, and Masaki Iwasaki. Kicho! Jammers, and that came out in the arcade, the Neo Geo, and the Neo Geo CD in 1994, the PS4 in 2017, and the Switch in 2018. The track was called You Got a Power, Concrete Court, and was composed by Seiichi Hamada, Tomiyashi Sato, and Masaki Iwasaki. 
This song is great. I love this song. <laughs> it's so good. It's so goofy. I love those vocals. Yeah, you got dance, power. Dance to the rhythm. Dance to the rhythm. It sounds like, it reminds me of, if you've ever seen the episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, <laughs> where Charlie's singing, pretending to be Bob Dylan. And so he's oh, just like, hey, oh. everybody, <laughs> like trying to do his best Bob Dylan impersonation. So yeah. every time I hear, dance to the rhythm, dance, like as soon as it comes in, I'm like, Charlie, every time. <laughs> I don't know why. But I love this groove. It's so fun and fresh. And it's the perfect like song to hear while you're playing with jammers. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I love the combination of sort of chiptune-esque yeah. music with the actual, like, I, I don't know if you'd call them PCM samples because they don't sound, I mean, maybe they are, but they, yeah. they don't sound scratchy enough to be PCM samples, if you know what I mean. Okay. Like, mo most PCM samples that, that you hear in games, like, you can you can tell it's a PCM sample because yeah. it, it sounds like this. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, it's definitely a PCM sample. It's just because it's arcade, it's it's a lot cleaner sounding. That's fair. So, and the other systems that it was put on, I mean, Neo Geo was practically an arcade machine. Yeah. And the other things, just better, you get better quality out of them. So. Right, arguably, but yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Um, no, I would I say other things, I'm not like the PS4, the Switch. Sure. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Other thing, the other things that it was released on. Yeah. I um, mean, Neo Geo CD, you, you get Red Book Audio on that, yeah. so. Data East is really doing a great job. Well, not Data East anymore. Right. It's, you know, G-Mode or whoever is handling uh, these franchises, not just Windjammers, but uh, one of the other games that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Mm. You know, a lot of Data East works are being re-released in modern eras. There's even like uh, those like more casual gaming style like mini arcade machines that Data East oh, is coming yeah, out with. Yeah. And so it's really cool to see Data East collections and Data East games kind of brought back into the gaming atmosphere on a regular basis so that way uh, these games don't die out and that people can play them and even some of their like really super obscure games are coming back into form. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, even even at that, there uh, there, there is a, a sequel to Windjammers called Windjammers 2, planned for release on the Nintendo Switch and the PC in 2019. Right, so, right, right. I mean, it's, it's making some kind of a comeback, which yeah, is really cool. Yeah, definitely. And I think especially on the Switch, it's really capitalizing on the retro scene, which yeah. most gamers are going to the Switch for. So yep, yeah, with the, the, the was it the Virtual Console? Uh, Does the Switch have a Virtual Console? No, no, that's, no, that's no. the Wii and the Wii U. Yeah, I just I just think that the Switch is a great portable system that has uh, done a really good job of capturing like retro developers. I love this song's like '50s '60s kind of like sock hop at atmosphere. <laughs> mixed with like an 80s kind of energy yeah i guess you yeah. could say it's th really makes this track stand out and, and shine <laughs> that and those goofy lyrics yeah uh, I, I feel like i sort of more of like a, a surf rock vibe from it yeah i can see um, that mostly because of the, the the way that the guy was singing and just sort of like the guitar licks yeah yeah that's true yeah that guitar solo like towards the end yeah, the yeah. Da -na 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 yeah it's really good <laughs> Yeah, Windjammers had a physical release on PS4 fairly recently. Like, oh, with, yeah, well, like, I missed with, that too. Yeah, a limited run released uh, that uh, they released a regular version and a special edition that came with a frisbee, which is really cool. <laughs> nice. And the soundtrack also, I think, is getting a vinyl release pretty soon, That's which is really pretty cool. cool. But on top of that. The sale, I think, is going to be done by now, but Limited Run is doing, or did, rather, a sale for the Switch version of Windjammers. Oh. And, again, vinyl release uh, that they're releasing, and also uh, the special edition that comes with the Frisbee. So, nice. yeah, so if you're a Switch owner, hopefully you grab this, because I believe the PS4 version shot up in price. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, but yeah, Windjammers, like, I've played it, like, a ton, I have, I picked it up for, like, a buck fairly recently for, on, uh, PS4. They had, like, a crazy sale on it. Huh. I ended up downloading it for, like, $1.79, and it was well worth it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I wish that I had more people to play with online. It's got online play, right? It does, yeah. it has online play, which is really cool. So, I, yeah, I wish I had more people to play online with, but it's still really 
really awesome game. Yeah. Super addictive <laughs> and fun and really simple. It's basically a frisbee game, like a volleyball frisbee game. It's like Tron uh, Deadly Discs. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, you're playing as whatever nationality that you choose to pick. You know, uh, Japan, America, Germany, Italy. Yeah. Six playable, uh, six playable characters, each of their unique speed and power ratings yeah. and special throws. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like um, Tron Diddly Discs meets uh, Super Dodgeball. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, because you get these crazy throws that you could use. Yeah. Or, like, you could throw it and it'll go toward the wall, like, stick to the wall and then, like, shoot really fast and it'll knock you back into the net, which is cool. Hmm. Uh, there's ones that, like, go in a circle, like a spiral or whatever. It's, it's a really fun game that is heavily bent on, like, replayability yeah, so yeah. it's one of those games you could keep coming back to uh, pretty much anybody could pick up and play it within five minutes so it's designed to be played in the arcade but it's a great multiplayer game yeah 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 the composers are, are all folks that we have talked about uh seichi cool. hamada we spoke about after the intro uh they they worked on joe and mac and a right. of other things yep tom sato we we've talked about yep. and masaki iwasaki we, we've spoken about at length all right. So uh, I think we are moving on to your last Yeah, tracks. your tracks are done. We're moving on to my tracks now. So we got Metal Max Returns, which came out for the Super Famicom in 1995. This is before the rights to the Metal Max series transferred over to different companies. So this is when Data East was specifically working on them with Createch. The track is called Battle, and it's by Satoshi Kadokura. Welcome back to our podcast, our spotlight on Data East. That was Metal Max Returns on the Super Famicom. It came out in 1995. The track is called Battle and it's by Satoshi Kadokura. So the Metal Max games I really don't know that much about. They are open-ended, they're non-linear RPGs, and they're more like, they're not like fantasy-based. They're more like modernized like you could uh, control like tanks and guns and stuff like that like you go through towns and whatnot so it's a much more like modernized kind of like um, the Advance Wars it takes inspiration from yeah I was just thinking about that yeah or rather Advance Wars I would say takes inspiration from Metal Max considering the dates yeah yeah (laughs) yeah so there's this thing called the vehicle system in the game uh, where characters can like ride vehicles in it. So the game originally was released on the Famicom as an exclusive, but then it got released for the Super Famicom as a re-release. It's a redo. Like they completely remade the game. Oh. So that's this version. That's Metal Max Return. So it's, it's the first game just redone in sixteen bit. Redone in sixteen bit. Exactly. Neat. Right. Right. So yeah, and the ending to the game, at least on the Famicom version, can be determined depending on. Uh, your actions in the game, so different endings. Multiple endings. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, it's pretty cool. So, yeah, I really want to check this one out because I love the music in this. I mean, this is straight up super awesome Mega Man X style yes. guitar driven rock that I absolutely love. I just love that really speedy, thrashy kind of riff. And then when those organs come in too, it's kind of a breath of fresh air. That do 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 do. It's still got like a nice groove to it. Um, there's not a lot going on with this song, but it does have that really awesome, like, prevalent bass 
that we've been talking about throughout this entire episode. Yeah, the two notes that I made is like the, the guitar sounds like Storm Eagle. It's absolutely like right out of Mega Man X, and I, I love that. Yeah. And then I, I, I noted we, we are back to that really strong, really driving bass line. Yeah. And I mean, those two things, uh, I. I I love the song. <laughs> yeah. So the developer on the Super NES version is, I believe, a different developer. It's not Createc or Data East, even though it was published by Data East. So the developer is like Kuso Kagaku. But the Metal Max series really hasn't seen that many releases here in the States. Mm. It's mostly been a strictly Japanese series. But uh, Metal Max Returns did get a fan translation, which you can check out in, I believe it was translated fairly recently. So. Mm. But uh, apparently Metal Max Returns, uh, more than 170,000 copies of the game were sold at a price of 12,800 yen per copy, which is the equivalent of $165. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I love this track, and the game really seems awesome, so I, I really need to check this out. I want to get a, a like a, I want to get a repro copy oh, yes, of this yes. game. So, Satoshi Kanakura is the composer labeled on this one. And uh, there's a good reason for that. Did the music for Metal Max, Metal Max 2, which came out on the Super NES, and the game that we're talking about now, as well as Metal Saga in 2005, hmm. Make, or Mike, M-E-I-Q, Labyrinth of Death, and also Metal Max Xeno in 2018, also huh. did the music for the newest one. Came out on the PS4, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I believe I heard something about maybe Switch as well. So, hmm. yeah. So, we're rounding the corner. This is our last track coming up. And again, we're going to be talking about a game which also has seen recent re-release on the Switch in 2018. We're hoping that it also comes out on some other systems. This is an arcade game called Night Slashers. It came out in 1993. And this track is called Under the Moonlight Stage 3. It's by Tomoyoshi Sato and Tatsuya Keiuchi.
welcome back to XVGM Radio. That was our final track of the Data East Retrospective, and that was from an amazing soundtrack for Night Slashers, and that came out in the arcade in 1993. It was finally ported to console uh, via the Switch in 2018. The track was Under the Moonlight Stage 3. It's by Tomoyoshi Sato and Tatsuya Keiuchi. So I found out about this game within the past few years and it has I've never actually sat down and played through it I've played it briefly but I've never played through it did you grab it on MAME? uh yeah I downloaded it on MAME nice. and uh you know at one point or another this was the only way to play this game because right, right. it got obviously limited release in arcades but it was recently released on the Switch and honestly it's one of the only games that makes me want to switch. <laughs> that and also Ninja Warriors is getting a re-release. Oh. Ninja Warriors for the huh. Super NES and yeah. Ninja Warriors Returns. So they're re-releasing that game and like giving it the Wild Guns Reloaded treatment, blowing it up, you know, making it widescreen and making Very it cool. HD yeah. and new music on probably a new stage. I don't know. Who knows? But uh, if... Yeah, that's... It, it's stuff like this that really makes me want to switch. So like... The fact that Night Slashers is exclusive to the Switch and not on the PS4, which I already have, right, right. it really makes it a solid selling point. And it's a fun little arcade game. Uh, it's kind of like monster-themed, if yeah. you will. It's very similar to Final Fight. So you can play as three different characters. Jake Hunter, who's like an American monster hunter guy with... He has like cybernetic, cybernetic arms. arms. Yeah. Yes. Then there's Christopher Smith. He's a European male vampire hunter as well as a martial artist. And there's Zhao Hong Hua, who is an Asian female martial artist who is also a mystic. Hmm. So really cool stuff. And there's a lot of blood and gore in the Japanese <laughs> version. And what they did was they censored it, changed it to green ah, in the yes. uh, international version. So there's a lot of like voiceover like PCM samples, not only in the music, but in the game itself. When you're playing it, uh, the characters will like have like little catchphrases, you know, like uh, oh, it's yeah. now or never, you yeah, know, yeah, stuff yeah. like stuff like that, which they'll repeat constantly <laughs> to the point where it's like, all right, we get it, it's now or never, or whatever. Uh, so it's like Dynasty Warriors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I love beat 'em ups and anything that's horror themed. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna eat that up like it's gravy. Yeah, this looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I have to say it, we should get like a meme thing going and yeah. play and like play some of these like or a switch. Or if you get a switch, oh, I have a switch. You have a switch, yeah. so you should download this. I'll have to look into this and, and then, then, and then bring, bring it over, it over my house. We can play it in the world's tiniest controller. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man. So, yeah, no, I, I, I dig this game, and the soundtrack is phenomenal, and this song is, oh, so good! Yeah, no, I'm, so I'm glad good. we saved this one for last, Yeah, this, this is a really, a really cool song. I've played this on Pixel Tunes uh, previously, possibly <laughs> on a Halloween episode, or like a free picks, I can't remember, but, yeah. oh man, it's so good. I mean, where do I start? I love that main riff, that shuggy, like, da 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 it's got that Castlevania vibe, the yeah. Baroque era, absolutely. <laughs> but at the same time, I love the PCM samples because it gives it like a weird fake feeling to me. Yeah, yeah. It, it's almost like there's a little like monster <laughs> who like pops out randomly with like a little electronic keytar. And he's just like, and then the song just like, dan, 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 and just kicks back into that main riff. Uh. So that's what I picture. In this song, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny you, you mentioned um, like the like a Castlevania influence or whatever, and that was something that that I kind of picked up on. Sure, uh, pretty close to the beginning. I, Shocker. I, I don't. Yeah, well, I was, like as far as it being one of your picks, I was like, oh, yeah. it kind of sounds like Castlevania. Okay, I, I you know, I, I right. guess that makes sense. Yeah, um, I didn't really get any any like a, a Baroque vibe out of it. Which I think is, it's which those is, key, the harpsichord. Maybe. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah, because it was funny because I like that was the first thing that went through my head. Is like, oh, I get kind of a Castlevania vibe out of this, but it doesn't feel baroque. Yeah, <clears throat> no, mostly that the the fact that there's a harpsichord yeah, included yeah. Uh, more towards the later part of the track, where it's just dun, 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 that part, like yeah, that yeah. that kind of what I was talking about. But that makes sense. Yeah, yeah no, I, I I I guess I was 
too caught up in the rest of the track to, really yeah. to, to even notice the harpsichord chord because you mentioned it and I'm like oh I, I guess I did hear it there but mm -hmm. like I wasn't I wasn't really paying attention to yeah. it. Yeah, you've got a driving bass as well in this track, but yep. I think the star is those squeedly meanly yep. guitars. Yeah, and I just love the fact that those PCM sampled. I, I'm almost positive those are PCM sampled guitar licks. That would make the most sense. Yeah, uh, just because like, they sound fake. Yeah, yeah, you know. They sound like different than the main guitar riff. Yeah. So. No, Arcade in 1993. I'm I'm fairly certain that those are PCM samples. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that they kind of repeat and the way that they repeat, that's what also kind of triggers it to me. Yeah. Because it yeah. sounds like almost like it's getting cut off. You oh know? yeah. There's yeah. like a bit of a fuzz in between like it getting cut off and like the rest of the song. So, yeah. So that's kind of my thing about it. But I could be very wrong about that. But it's just kind of how it sounds to me. If you know the truth, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> let us know. Send us an email at xvgmradio at gmail.com or facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash xvgmradio. May as well get it out of the way right Smoothest now. Smoothest transition Yes, ever. yes. <laughs> All right. Let's back up a bit, though. Yes. Favorite track of the podcast. You first. Oh, me first. <laughs> Oh, so much good stuff on this one. I'm <laughs> going to go with Atomic Runner. Oh, okay. I'm going to go with okay. Atomic Runner. I really dug that. I I guess it kind of caught me by surprise because, again, I... You didn't expect the I arcade version to be that. didn't expect the arcade yeah. version to be as good, if not possibly better than the Genesis version. <laughs> but I really like that. Um, solid follow-up, though, Night Slashers, for real. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yes. What about you? Um, I am torn between the Metal Match Returns track okay. uh, and the Windjammers track. Okay. Um, yes. I, 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 the Windjammers track was really goofy, but um, I, I'm just I'm really digging it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think I'm I think I'm gonna go with that. Yeah. The Windjammers, you got a power. Yeah, yeah. So oh. check us out at xvgmradio.com again or facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash xvgmradio. Let us know what your favorite track was. Yes, yeah. we like to know, uh, you know what worked for you, what didn't work for you. Uh, was there a track in here that you wish we didn't play and we should strike from the list? Check us out on our social media. We have Twitter and Instagram. Both have the same handle at XVGM Radio. Feel free to follow us there. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Give us a retweet. A yeah. Comment. Yeah. You know. Uh, uh, we also have a. Patreon, to which we would like to thank our patrons for the lovely equipment that we are currently now recording on. Yes. A new microphone, new mixer, yes. all sorts of fun stuff. It's just going to get better from here. Yes. Uh, eventually, we hope like, that this sounds better than previous episodes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, someday, eventually, Mike will make the patrons pay for a arcade cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> for a Robocop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> our, our patrons uh, are Alex Messenger, Scott McElhone, Cam Worma, Chris Murray, Kung Fu Carlito, Chris Myers, Peter Panda, The Autistic Gamer 89, and Mixmaster. Yes. Thank you very much for your patronage. We really it appreciate it. Yes. All the money goes towards good causes, I swear, not Robocop <laughs> arcade machines. Unless it's okay with you. Unless it's okay with you. <laughs> <laughs> no. One more thing about Patreon. If you are not a Patreon and you were considering it, uh, hemming and hawing over it, something that we recently changed, we changed it well before this episode released, yeah. but we want to make sure that folks know, we changed some of the tiers around because we realized that uh, things weren't really as good as they could be, so we changed specifically the live show tier. I believe it was a $10 tier. Right. Um, we said that's silly. Yep. And uh, we put that down to the $1 tier. So even $1, it gets you a thank you at the end of the episode. Yep. And uh, it will get you into the live shows that we're going to do monthly starting yes. in January. Yeah. So. so stay tuned to the Patreon if you are a patron because we will be announcing dates for those shows. They'll yep. most likely be on weekends, so that way you can tune in, and that's about it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and as far as the live shows go, I want to say it now, because hopefully this will come out before our first live show. Yeah. First off, if you're a patron and you don't have a Discord, um, you're going to want to get in Discord, because that's how we're doing the live shows. Right, believe, right? it's free, it doesn't yep. cost anything. Uh, if you are a patron and you have a Discord and you do not have your Discord information, 
in Patreon, I would urge you to, to do that because yep. while we just set this up the other day, our Discord will recognize that you're a patron and it will automatically give you access to the live show right. channel. Right, right. Um, if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, please reach out to us to let us know so that we can add you to that. Correct. Um, otherwise, you're going to miss out on the live shows uh, when you shouldn't and then we'll feel really bad. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right, so coming up next episode. Super exciting. Super exciting. We are joining forces with our good pal Nico, a.k.a. the Wii Guy. And we are going to be talking about Game Boy. The very first Game Boy. So the OG Game Boy. Not Game Boy Color, not Game Boy Advance. Just right. original Game Boy games. Good old black and green. Yes. Or, or green and darker green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tons of amazing songs on this episode stay tuned for it it's going to be a great one and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks once again this is mike and justin signing off for xvgm radio good night Tenno, tenno, 15 miles away <laughs> what we can, we can absolutely cut that <laughs> we can absolutely <laughs> yeah. not cut that <laughs> uh We'll edit this out. We'll edit this out. We'll edit this out. <laughs> hey, did you know we'll edit this out?